want to tell you the story of the land of Lincoln. So I'm not going to tell you about this guy. I'm not going to talk about Illinois. I'm going to talk about Thomas Lincoln, hashtag the other land of Lincoln. Thomas was Abraham's father, and his land was Kentucky. And Abraham, in fact, was born there in 1809. But after a few years, Thomas Lincoln up and moved his family to Indiana. And looking back on this, Abraham Lincoln said that the primary reason for this move was a difficulty with land titles in Kentucky. You see, over the course of a few years, Thomas Lincoln was involved in multiple disputes. He had to move. He lost land. And by 1816, he'd had enough. Why invest in the land if you risk losing it? Now, at the time, Kentucky was the frontier. And war veterans and others in earlier years had been granted something called land patents in order to encourage settlement. And part of the responsibility of claiming the land was that you had to provide a survey, a meets and bounds survey, a verbal description of your property lines using the physical features of the land. Like this survey of Abraham Lincoln's boyhood home, as it read in 1986 when it was sold to the National Park Service. It refers to 36 trees, three fences, a bridge, a drain, a stump. So you can imagine this kind of verbal description of the land could lead to problems. See, the early pioneers, they were not professional surveyors. And sometimes, intentionally or unintentionally, they would describe the same property using different features, different trees. And you'd get overlapping property lines. And they gave it a name for this in Kentucky. They called it shingling because it looked like roofing shingles overlapping each other. Now, why were things so much better in Indiana? Well, in Indiana, the land was government owned to begin with. And prior to sale, it was professionally surveyed into rectangular townships and rectangular lots. And it's one of these lots that Thomas Lincoln bought in 1817 when he moved there. It's the southwest quarter of section 32. It's pretty simple, isn't it? And it's a stark contrast to the survey that we saw in Kentucky. The certainty of these boundaries, the clarity of these rights, it gave people the confidence to invest in the land. So why did Lincoln move? Because people prefer certainty to uncertainty. They prefer Indiana to Kentucky. And no offense to anyone from Kentucky out there, it's a lovely place. But it provides a cautionary tale for discussing the patent system, technological change, and economic growth. See, just as land patents encourage settlement, patents on inventions are government rights that encourage innovation. So if you have a patent, then for a period of years, no one else can use your invention without your permission. And if it's useful in the marketplace, you can make some money. But the patent is not a reward. It's the incentive to develop the technology to begin with and to tell people about how it works. It's a twofer. We get the technology, and we get the information that we need to build on it. So this is part of what we call the market for technology. And if there's one thing that economists like, it's a market. We love markets. My wife doesn't like it when I spend too much time alone with a the market. They're beautiful. They bring people together, usually buyers and sellers, and they trade. And the key is that voluntary trade makes both parties better off. And it literally creates wealth. So suppose I want to sell you my car. Well, OK, this isn't my car. <laughs> I'm not sure who told you that. Um, but let's pretend. This is a 1972 Ferrari Dino. And let's say it's my car, and that I value it for $100,000. But you value it for $150,000. So you can imagine that it would be fairly easy for us to agree on a price that would make both of us better off. And if we can do that, 
then regardless of the price, we've just created $50,000 worth of wealth in the economy because we've taken an asset that was worth $100,000 and we've transformed it into one that's worth $150,000 just through trade alone. That's incredible. It's simple, it's beautiful, it's elegant, and it works, except when it doesn't. Like when there's a lot of uncertainty in a market. Like when people flee Kentucky for the certainty of Indiana. So when I was a student, we would shop at a grocery outlet. This was a literal outlet for groceries. Overstocks, discontinued products, they had a scratch and dent section where some of the cans were missing their labels entirely. We would call these maybe beans. Like, they may be beans. We'd get them home, nope, not beans. It's cream of something. <laughs> but we didn't care because we were poor, and no one can charge full price for these cans. These are Kentucky cans. <laughs> People prefer certainty to uncertainty. They prefer Indiana cans to Kentucky cans. And it's the same in every market. Certainty makes the market work better. But this is particularly important in the market for technology because historically and globally, technology is the primary driver of economic growth. It is the single thing that most distinguishes our lives today from those of our ancestors. Think just about how you got here today. Now, imagine doing that trip with Archimedes, or Joan of Arc, or Da Vinci, or Thomas Lincoln. You'd blow their minds. Well, maybe not Da Vinci. He'd say, yeah, I thought of that. <laughs> but Archimedes would be running around going, Eureka, Eureka, Eureka. Think about my favorite underappreciated technology, refrigeration and cooling. Obviously, this makes our lives more comfortable, as it is today. But it goes way beyond that, because refrigeration actually radically transformed our economy, because it enabled the long-distance hauling of perishable goods. You know when it says, store in a cool, dry place? Yeah, well, there weren't any, except at the top of a mountain, which was inconvenient. So it now enabled this cross-country trade in food. And what that did was it enabled regions to specialize and take advantage of economies of scale. That led to further advancements in planting and harvesting. Nationwide, we got higher quality food, we got more variety, and lower prices, which made everybody better off. So let's think a little bit about how this technology developed. The first refrigeration units were these big, beastly things that had the tendency to occasionally explode. So they were first used to produce the ice that was used for shipping, because you didn't want one of these things blowing up your train. But eventually, the units got smaller and safer, and we could have refrigerated rail cars. Because we could combine refrigeration technology, reliable power supply, insulated containers, and rail cars. Then the technology got smaller, got safer, we could get refrigerated delivery trucks. It got smaller and safer and we could put them in our homes. And now, gamers, like my kids, are putting them in their computers to cool down their video cards. What will these kids think of next? Which is kind of the point, because it's their generation that will develop the next advances, if they can pull themselves away from their video games. It's the market for technology, though, that makes this happen, because this pattern of innovation is common to all technological change. We combine previous technologies into something new, and then we improve it. But the market for technology works best with more certainty in it, which is why we want well-defined patent rights. So patent examiners and inventors, together they define the boundaries of patents. Inventors describe their technology and how to put it into practice. Patent examiners 
look it over and they make sure that the claims of the patent are clear and accurate, they comply with the law. But obviously this can be very challenging, especially in emerging technologies. Because when something is truly new, we may not even have the words for it. So really, inventors and patent examiners are like surveyors in a technological frontier. Imagine trying to define a complicated space in this landscape using meets and bounds, a verbal description, when you can't even see the entire picture because you're on the frontier. This is complicated. You see, in the patent system, there are no neat little rectangles because we can't survey the land ahead of time like we could in Indiana. So because of this, there is some inherent uncertainty. And that leads a lot of people to argue that the patent system looks a lot like Lincoln's Kentucky, with overlapping property lines, confusion, and a market for technology that doesn't work. But there are others that suggest that despite that uncertainty, the market for technology works more like Indiana. So which is it, Kentucky or Indiana? Well, I'm an economist, so I'm gonna say it depends. Because it can be either or both. It depends on the technology. And really, maybe it doesn't matter so much where we are as where we're going. See, the people of Kentucky didn't just throw up their hands and give up private property. They were dealt a bad hand. But they did what they could to mitigate it. So for them, that meant professional surveyors, permanent boundary markers, better record keeping. These things reduced the uncertainty, helped them to clean up the shingling from the frontier days. So really, regardless of where we start, the policy goal is the same. We should make the patent system more like Indiana. Now when it comes to policy, I'm a big fan of what we call evidence-based policy making. But some policy questions are hard, and evidence is often hard to get. And sometimes we come up against what I like to call policy-based evidence making, <laughs> which is neither good policy nor good evidence. But sometimes things are a little easier. You see, we know that people prefer certainty to uncertainty, and it makes the market work better. In the patent system, that means high-quality patent examination, well-defined rights, an easy way to fix mistakes, transparency in the system, especially transparency in ownership. These things reduce uncertainty in the system as a whole for all technologies. See, the parable of the land of Lincoln tells us how important it is to create certainty in the market for technology because it has the potential to create real and meaningful change, and that brings economic opportunities to everybody. It puts us on the road to Indiana, and that's where we want to be. Thank you. <laughs>